everyone. We'll now begin our first session with our public health partners. Up next, we have Dr. George Peck and Dr. Bethany Boiling from Texas Department of State Health Services, Ms. Nina Daco from Tarrant County, and then Mr. Stephen Hinosa from Hidalgo County. And it looks like you are ready to go, Dr. Peck, so I will hand it over to you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Okay. And um, is the slide visible? It is. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, as many of you know, um, I'm taking over for Whitney Qualls, who um, moved on about a year ago. And um, I uh, I'm very honored to be part of this group and to be participating. Um, there's one thing I did wanna mention before I start. I don't think anyone had mentioned it, but uh, last week, Dr. Bill Walton from the PACVEC Center of Excellence in California passed away. And so um, he was a great mentor to me and many of you may have heard of him or known him for his work in integrated mosquito management. Um, and so in his honor, because he loved to wear Hawaiian shirts, I am wearing a Hawaiian shirt today. So without further ado, um, let's go on and talk about um, the Texas Department of State Health Services and um, what they do and how they uh, are a component of this large vector puzzle. Um, primarily, we are a technical consultant agency um, where um, we work in collaboration with um, other agencies to um, facilitate transfer of funds, to work with contracting, to do an, a number of things. Um, and since I've only been here just two months now, I'm still wrapping my head around all of the nuances of that, but I I'm seeing a picture um, forming and I'm seeing how it all works together. And um, I'm working with partners and with Whitney and with others to um, forward the process. So we do um, support contracts, including cooperative agreements and star requests, um, which are um, all routed through our offices. Um, and we do laboratory services as well. And Dr. Bowling will be elaborating on those more fully today. So why did I do this um, slide and this idea of human cases? Um, um, well, primarily they're arthropod born, but just to get a sense of the last 20 years and what Texas's challenges have been. So I went through all of our data um, all the way up until this year, to just get a sense of what's going on. Um, and the different types of diseases and the different vectors, and then the total cases. And these are human cases that have been reported because they're reportable diseases. And you can see some are very small, like anapl anaplasmosis, um, California encephalitis group, um, Chagas disease, well, a little bit bigger, uh, chikungunya, yes, it's there. Um, dengue, yes, it's there, but um, greater than 95% of these cases are reported as um, related to foreign travel. Um, ehrlichiosis, it's there, it's being reported. Um, Leishmania, um, here and there, it seems to be increasing, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and in fact, just this week, um, we got our first report of a cat um, being a reservoir for Leishmania. Um, Lyme disease, or um, we have many reported cases in Texas, but all of these seem to be traced back to travel abroad rather than travel within Texas. And then malaria, again, travel related. Um, spotted fever rickettsials, um, almost a thousand cases. So definitely something local, something to be considering. Um, St. Louis encephalitis um, reported and um, both in the mosquitoes and in human cases. Um, 
tick-borne relapsing fevers, not so much, but still on the radar. Tularemia, not so much, but on the radar. radar. Um, Flea-borne typhus, almost 5,000 cases in, in 20 years. So certainly an ongoing issue and an ongoing problem. And I've heard a lot about that in the presentations. Western, uh, West Nile virus, um, 3,000 cases, um, uh, both encephalitis cases and then fever cases. Um, so definitely um, ever since it first arrived here in Texas in the early 2000s, an ongoing issue. And then Zika, yes, it was here. Um, yes, herd, herd immunity is most likely developed and um, most of it is travel related. Now let's go back away from the human cases to the insect cases and um, take a look at um, arbovirus activity in Texas. And this um, slide represents pooling everything, um, including mosquito pools, avian sources, equine sources, and sentinel chickens. But primarily, of course, it's from mosquito pools. Um, and so you can see there's a variety of arthropod-borne viruses here in the slide. Um, and West Nile, at least through 2002 and 2011, was the primary concern there. Although Eastern equine does show up and St. Louis does show up and then some rare cases of in California encephalitis group. Um, chikungunya not reportable. Dengue was being tested for, but wasn't showing up. And Western equine, very low. So going into the years past 2011, we see that in some cases, a certain um, um, diseases weren't tested for. And when they were tested for, they were showing up as not detected. For example, dengue. Um, now, Again, while dengue is here and um, shows up as a human case, um, it's not showing up in the mosquitoes. Um, Japanese encephalitis hasn't been tested for. Um, and so um, St. Louis encephalitis, um, the records within the zoonosis branch show 92 cases. However, um, there's other records that we're um, reviewing within the laboratory branch that show a, a larger number in the hundreds. But the point is it's, it's here, it's something to be concerned about as going forward. And then West Nile of course is, is the elephant in the room um, with over 20,000 arbovirus detected detections. Um, so this um, will be more fully um, elucidated by Dr. Bowling, um, but um, just to say that there is um, some key players in Texas that we all know about, and Culex quinquefasciatus is the key player, especially in terms of West Nile. Um, Culex tarsalis, yes, indeed, it's showing up as well. Um, and also for St. Louis, uh, Culex tarsalis seems to be the main vector, at least in terms of the laboratory testing data. And then for Western equine, tarsalis is also an important um, component of that epidemiology as well. Looking graphically at Texas from the years 2002 and 2009 for St. Louis positive mosquito pools, um, there were almost 300 and um, a mix of three species that were involved, primarily quinquefasciatus, um, but tarsalis, especially over in the El Paso area and then rest you ends up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, going again, the same um, years with the same map. For West Nile virus, the number of species increases, but primarily um, the overriding effect is uh, quinquefasciatus and tarsalis, and uh, tarsalis more in Northern Texas and Western Texas. Collaborations, this is an ongoing um, effort with our group to reach out and be part of all of Texas and all of necessary collaborations and important collaborations. And these include Texas A&M AgriLife with Stegomaya detection, um, Rio Grande Valley um, for um, all of the um, nuances and different types of things going on there, including um, resistance testing and just general surveillance in terms of diversity and changes over time in the dynamics and diversity of those populations along the Texas-Mexico border. We're very interested in that. Um, 
And Texas Tech is also involved in our resistance testing. And then um, the training through Texas AgriLife is an important component of what we support as well. Moving on to diseases that are tick-borne. Um, there are six diseases that we are tracking currently. Um, anaplasmosis or lichiosis, Lyme, uh, spotted fever group, rickettsiosis, uh, the relapsing fevers and tularemia. And what we offer is a downloadable form to all of citizens within Texas, including medical practitioners, dermatologists, and so forth. Um, when a tick is found, um, these forms can be filled out and submitted back to us along with samples. And once we make an identification in the lab, we send them off to the University of North Texas to the Allen lab, where they get initial screenings to genus level, um, Borrelia or, Lich or Lichia or Rickettsia, and then to species level as well. There's no charge for this testing. Um, the service is only for human exposures and only for residents submitting from a Texas address. And as a cautionary note, the primary service is for surveillance and not for diagnosis. Of course, we always um, advise uh, admitters to seek help immediately um, for any type of a tick bite from a medical practitioner for prophylactic treatment um, and ongoing observation for any symptoms. Um, passive tick surveillance can be basically outlined um, as seen here in this table. Um, there seems to be five or six main species that are of importance. Um, Amblyoma americanum, Amblyoma species, um, a dermacenter species and an Ixodes species. And what I'd like to draw your attention to, and of course I'm preaching to the choir, when mostly what we're seeing is Rickettsia amblyomatis in the ticks that we test. And primarily it's the Lone Star tick showing up. Um, Rickettsia parkeri, it's there, but in small numbers, and then Ehrlichia chaffiensis as, as, as well in small numbers. Um, and uh, down at the bottom, just to draw your attention to uh, Rickettsia rickettsii and Borrelia burgdorferi, at least in the testing we have documented, um, it's almost non-existent as an infection within the, text in te within the ticks in Texas. So as a side note, and I know that um, one of our um, student interns mentioned this yesterday, and I'd just like to uh, elaborate it on a bit. Rickettsia amblyomatis, um, it's the most common and widely distributed uh, rickettsial um, spotted fever group um, infection in the Americas. Um, um, according to Carpathy, just to um, share some of the results there, it, it can uh, elicit a robust immune response and disease magnification in some patients. And so what I'm thinking, it wasn't mentioned, but from an ecological point of view, there may be some competitive exclusion going on where uh, rickettsia amblyomatis co-infection with all these other rickettsias like parkeri and rickettsia rickettsii. Um, there's inhibition. Um, this is, um, something we'll learn more about as the science comes forward with it, but it's certainly very common in nature and in the world that some species inhibit others and we're well known. Um, for example, Wolbachia is a great example. Um, and then th there's a complicated diagnosis due to cross reactivity. Um, I think one of the speakers yesterday mentioned that this is a mess um, and it's up to us to elucidate why and to understand it more carefully. Um, and that sometimes the diagnosis looks like a Rocky Mountain spotted fever case. So it's um, difficult for the physician sometimes to know what is presenting. And then there's also this syndrome, the Southern tick associated rash that can complicate the diagnosis. Um, so that, that can be um, also an area that we're the, worthy of study. Other diseases we're following, um, Arthropod born is the tick born murine typhus with rickettsia typhi and rickettsia species vectored through the tick, and then um, Chagas um, vectored through the kissing bug with the causative agent as T. cruzi. You have one minute, Dr. Peck. Okay, so um, just want to mention that we are following it and numbers and cases are available. 
Um, this is a breakdown by county. Um, so um, I'll let you talk more, or, or you could email me with questions regarding what counties are showing up and why and the numbers and so forth, but it is here. Um, and typhus is historically important in Texas and will continue to be monitored. There's a map showing the typhus and where the hotspots are um, and Chagas. Um, so um, it's here, but transmission is very low, yet infection rates are very high in the Chagas vector, over 50%. We're still not sure why. Um, locally acquired cases are common. Um, and sometimes they're uh, travel, but most of the time um, they, um, they do have the travel associated with them. And we do offer a questionnaire and we do look at these, come into the lab with these and be able to identify them and then send them off to the CDC for testing to be sure it's positive for Cruzi and then report back to the practitioners and patients. And uh, all of that is something we well know. The numbers have continued in its 2019, 54% of the vectors are positive for Chagas, but very few cases. Um, where's the future going? Um, that's what we're learning today, but we want to help and be a partner in expanding surveillance, expanding testing, expanding training, and facilitating scientific discovery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peck, and welcome to the network. Thank you. So, thank you for remembering and honoring Dr. Walton as well. We appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. All right, up next, also from Texas DHS, we have Dr. Bethany Bowling. Dr. Bowling, if you could share your video and then share your screen. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I want to uh, say thank you for the invitation uh, to speak about our program today. Um, I also wanted to say that we're really happy to have Dr. Peck uh, join our team. I actually just got to meet him uh, this past week. Uh, so we're, we're great. We're very happy to have him as a part of um, our program at DSHS. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the impacts of COVID-19 on our surveillance program. And what I'm going to do is start out and give an overview of our laboratory and the services that we provide. And then I'm going to talk about what happened as COVID-19 uh, came into the picture and how we had to modify things to adjust. Um, and then I have a few slides at the end to give a summary of the data uh, that we, we can show based on what we detected in Texas this year. So uh, I work at the State Laboratory and we're located in downtown Austin. We're a couple miles north of the state capitol. Um, and here's a list of services that we provide to jurisdictions in Texas. So we provide mosquito species identification and we do this year round. Um, so local jurisdictions can go out and trap mosquitoes, send them to us any time of the year will identify them. We also provide mosquito testing, and this is done from May through November each year. Um, this window can shift depending on if there's an outbreak or other needs, we can provide testing um, outside of those dates. Uh, we also do equine testing for arboviruses, and this is when our rabies lab uh, at the state lab, they get uh, horse specimens that test negative for rabies. Um, and then if they're negative for rabies, we test them for different arboviruses. And we do that year round. Um, and then we just recently started providing insecticide uh, resistance testing. So for our mosquito surveillance program, we target uh, certain species. Um, and Dr. Peck uh, just spoke about some of the species that we're most interested in. Uh, Culex fasciatus is our primary vector for West Nile in most of Texas. But as you mentioned, uh, Culex tarsalis can play a role in other parts of the state, um, like in the Panhandle and in West Texas. There's other Culex species that we target for testing um, that are important for West Nile transmission. And then also our Stegomyia species, Egypti and Albopictus are also important vectors uh, that we test. So our main testing program, uh, we use uh, multiplex assays uh, we have one assay for testing our Culex species, 
Uh, with that assay, we screened for West Nile, St. Louis, and Western equine encephalitis viruses. Um, and then our 80 species, uh, we screened for Zika, chikungunya, and dengue viruses. Uh, this assay is pan-dengue, so it picks up all four serotypes. If we did get a positive, we could then screen it with a separate fourplex assay so we could identify which serotype uh, was present. Uh, we also have a singleplex assay for triple E. So this is Eastern equine encephalitis virus. This is not an assay we use for broad surveillance, but it's available upon request. Um, sometimes we'll have horse cases in Texas or sentinel chickens that will seroconvert for triple E and we'll get requests to do this testing um, on targeted collections. So something else we provide is cell culture testing. So this is um, a way that we can provide broad surveillance uh, for new or emerging viruses or re-emerging arboviruses in Texas. So this is something that we do on about 25% or 20% of submissions that come in. Uh, these submissions are selected randomly uh, and they get an additional cell culture screen. And what we do is we inoculate the mosquito supernatants onto two different cell lines. And then we monitor those cells for cytopathic effects uh, for about 10 days uh, to see if anything starts to grow. If we do uh, detect CPE, we, we have other assays in place to determine what virus is present. But at 10 days, uh, we would call it negative if we don't detect any CPE. And this is a way we can be looking for viruses that we're not targeting with our molecular assays. And then as I mentioned, we're also uh, just started providing insecticide resistance testing and we're using the CDC bottle bioassay for this test. And we're, we've initially started with providing this for Aegypti and Alopictus because the money uh, that we received to get this going was, uh, there were Zika funds. So that's what we've started with and we intend to add on uh, Culex testing uh, in the future, hopefully soon. So just to talk about um, how COVID-19 has kind of impacted us this year. So in mid-March, uh, of course, there were discussions happening about shutdowns and how do we all navigate the situation and, and do the job that we need to do. And as a state agency, there were decisions being made regarding priorities um, and how many people we could have on campus and that sort of thing. So initially, our mosquito surveillance program was put on the non-critical list. Um, and so it, it was something that we weren't going to be pursuing. Um, and I obviously had concerns about this as well as others. And so I consulted with our zoonosis control branch and we wrote up a proposal to kind of justify why we felt it was important to continue um, with mosquito testing uh, in spite of other things that were happening uh, with COVID-19. Uh, so we wrote up a justification and some of the things that we included were the fact that um, this past year we had a mild uh, and wet winter. We had very little activity statewide for West Nile in 2019. So we felt like we might be primed uh, for more activity this year. Um, and as you can see in this little diagram, this shows based on our lab, the mosquito testing we've done, it shows the West Nile virus positive mosquito pools and they're looks like a cyclical pattern uh, for West Nile activity. And so uh, we were concerned about potentially another uptick um, in West Nile virus activity. And so we presented this information to our upper management um, and we were able to get approval to proceed with our program, but we had to uh, reduce our volume um, and also make some workflow modifications. Um, and what we had to consider in this process was social distancing, obviously. So we can only have so many people working in the lab uh, safely. Um, so that's one thing that we had to consider. Also, my lab was short staffed. So we had some changes in staff during this time and also some of my staff were pulled to support COVID testing uh, that the state was conducting. Um, and then I also had several new and untrained staff. So they only knew how to do certain tasks. So we kind of had to rethink um, what our volume could be and what we could actually do as a lab uh, with the staff that we had um, and also maintaining the social distancing. So at the beginning of April, I, I emailed all of our normal program participants 
Um, these are people or jurisdictions that usually send us mosquitoes. Um, and I let them know that we would be proceeding with our program, but we would have limited capacity and our testing might be a little bit different. So I, I try to get feedback from them to find out who all was actually interested in trapping because there was still a lot of uncertainties during this time about you know, what people could actually go out and do and, and what was safe. Um, so I asked about trapping plans and I received a lot of different responses. I would say more than half were actually ready to go and proceed uh, with their normal program and their normal trapping volumes, which was encouraging. There were some that just didn't respond. Uh, some responded and said they didn't know yet. They were still trying to figure things out. And some responded saying that they could maybe do, you know, a portion of their normal trapping, but not the full number of traps they normally would do. So based on all the information that we received uh, from our participants and looking at the numbers and what we had to work with, we decided to start with uh, half of our normal trapping uh, capacity, meaning a jurisdiction that would normally send us maybe 30 traps a week. I asked them to send 15. Um, and so I basically just cut everybody in half and uh, we proceeded that way at the beginning. And we did start on May 1st uh, receiving mosquitoes and that's our typical start date uh, for surveillance testing. So just to kind of give you a visual of what our normal program looks like, as I discussed in the beginning, this is our workflow in 2019. So we get mosquitoes um, from local jurisdictions all over Texas. And this top bar just shows our uh, insecticide resistance testing workflow. We receive eggs since they're, uh, we're focused on 80s right now. Uh, the eggs are hatched and reared to adults and then we conduct the bottle, bio, bottle bioassay for the resistance testing. And then the main part of our lab is this arbovirus surveillance testing. And this is where we receive adults um, in little cartons. Uh, when we get these uh, mosquitoes, they're actually received alive. Uh, we freeze them down, we identify them, uh, we count them, we generate reports right away. So the jurisdiction knows what species were in their traps and how many. Um, and then we pool the vector species for testing. And this is our typical test list that I showed earlier where we have quite a few Culex species that we target for testing, and then Aegypti and Albopictus as well. And then these are the different assays I discussed earlier, our Culex assay, our Triple E assay that we conduct, um, 80s assay that targets these viruses, and then the cell culture screening. And then the middle here, I'm just showing that uh, the horse specimens that we receive from the rabies lab that are screened uh, for arboviruses. And this is just to show visually how we were affected this year and what, what we had to um, postpone and what we had to modify uh, so that we could continue with our program. And so, as I mentioned, we had to decrease the number of traps coming in by about 50% of what we normally get. Uh, we put our insecticide resistance testing on hold. So we did not receive any eggs this year for that type of testing. We did proceed with our arbovirus uh, testing, but we limited here with our test list. So we decided to focus on our uh, primary uh, West Nile virus victors. So we just did testing on Culex quinquefaciatus and Culex tarsalis mosquitoes. We put our 80s testing on hold because we felt like uh, right now our, our main concern is, is West Nile and SLE. Um, and then we also put our cell culture surveillance testing on hold because I really didn't have the staff uh, to support that separate workflow. So by June, um, we were actually able to increase the number of traps coming in to 75% of the normal volume. And we, we were able to do that because some of the newer staff, uh, we were able to get trained on all of our protocols. And then as that training increased by August 1st, we were able to increase to 100% trap numbers. So the programs uh, sending us mosquitoes were, were able to send us their normal trap numbers by August 1st. And just a brief summary of what we um, saw this year, we had 38 participating counties. We had 44 agencies uh, sending us mosquitoes. Uh, we've tested over, now we've tested over 10,000 pools. We did have quite a bit of West Nile activity. We had over 825 West Nile pools and we did have 14 SLE uh, positive mosquito pools. Something different we did this year 
is we did um, help two different labs that were not able to do their normal um, mosquito testing. Uh, so Tarrant County and also San Antonio reached out and asked for help because their internal labs were overwhelmed with COVID testing. So we were able to help them by setting up alternative workflows to accommodate them. Um, we, like I said, we normally get pre we normally get live mosquitoes that we identify in our lab. But to work with these labs, they uh, sent us their pre-identified mosquito pools, and we worked out a different system to get the information. Uh, we used uh, Excel spreadsheets instead of the forms we typically used. Um, so I'm glad we were able to help with this because we did see a lot of activity in Tarrant County, um, and Nina will be talking about that uh, next. And this we just gives a snapshot. Sorry, Dr. Bowling, we have come to the end of your session. Okay. You can quickly wrap it up if you'd like. Okay, sure. <laughs> so this just gives a, a snapshot of, of what we detected in our lab. We had West Nile activity that we detected in quite a few counties throughout Texas. And we did detect SLE in several different counties. Usually we mainly see it in El Paso, but we did see it in um, South Texas this year as well. And it was also picked up um, by Texas Tech. So we did have SLE activity throughout the state. And just quickly, um, it, some of the conclusions, it was important to maintain surveillance despite the public health crisis that was going on because this was able to inform um, mosquito control activities throughout the state. Um, we were able to uh, continue with our program because we were had plenty of supplies. We had stocked up before the COVID issue began and so we were in a good position to continue with our program. Um, and we also had purchased backup equipment so we had plenty of equipment to do our testing. Um, and we're also now in a good position to help other labs going forward because we kind of have a process in place that we worked out with Tarrant County and also San Antonio. And, and I'm sure most of everybody in this audience is aware of the publication that came out by CDC, just talking about the importance of maintaining surveillance um, during natural uh, disasters and other public health emergencies. So this was um, helpful and, it, and it, I'm sure it'll be useful going forward if we have to face something like this again. And that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bowling. Next up, we have Ms. Nina Daco from Tarrant County. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. And can everyone see my uh, presentation? I do not see your screen yet. Um, Dr. Bowling, I don't know if you stopped sharing your screen. Okay, how about this? Now can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, my fault, not hers. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, and first off, I do want to thank uh, Bethany and, and uh, also the, the folks over at Dishes for all the help that they have been able to done because we had, well, quite frankly, a crazy year as everything in 2020 has been known to be. All right, so... Um, we're gonna move right along. I'm actually gonna skip our overview because there's a lot to talk about. Um, so Tarrant County is actually uh, in North Texas. So we are uh, near Dallas, but not what quite right next to Dallas. We're about 40 miles. Uh, Fort Worth is our county seat. We have approximately 2 million people. We have a mix of urban, suburban, and rural areas within the county, over 902 square miles. Now, here's where it gets complex. We have approximately 42 municipalities we have the ability of working with. Um, that includes mostly cities or villages, and then we do have a couple like uh, DFW Airport and our NASJRB, which is our Air Force Base, that uh, will occasionally give us samples. Uh, every municipality actually does its own vector control. This makes things very complex. We kind of oversee what's going on, but ultimately um, may not have uh, we, we, we can only make recommendations for our municipalities. These include a lot of folks from a lot of different backgrounds. Uh, so food inspectors, we have uh, people who work in environmental health, stormwater, code compliance, fire police, you name it, they probably have had some kind of section doing their vector control stuff. So again, this uh, presents challenges. Um, so what we typically do in a non-COVID uh, environment is uh, me and my staff work within the environmental health division. We do uh, trap uh, mosquitoes in the unincorporated portion of the county, and we identify and enumerate mosquitoes for the entire county. That's approximately around 200 traps um, per week um, around the area. 
We do have our own database system that is connected to an interactive map online so that our public can actually look and see um, what's going on and where positive traps have been. We do calculate risk assessment of MLE, that's maximum likelihood estimate, which is just a determination of mosquito uh, infectivity rates. Um, and also the vector index, which you take those infection rates of the mosquitoes and you uh, multiply them by the uh, abundance of mosquitoes per trap night. So it's kind of putting into place the population of mosquitoes, not just the infection rate. We also report these back to the cities. Uh, we do public outreach. We develop response plans. We also work in partnership with our laboratory. Um, so that includes their BRIA section of North Texas Regional Lab. BRIA stands for uh, Biotech bioterrorism response and emerging agents. They test our mosquitoes for West Nile virus and then also for humans, they'll do um, Zika, chikungunya and dengue viruses. Um, and of course, we'll report them back to the cities. EPI also does the human case investigations. They report them to us, we report them back to the cities. Uh, here's a picture of our mosquito lab as it normally sits. As you can see, there's a whole lot of microscopes at one of those tables, there's five of them and uh, two, you know, be in compliance with social distancing and COVID, we did have to move some of those microscopes around. So there's not quite as many microscopes there right now. I, I believe we have three. One of them have actually been moved to that middle, uh, the middle pack picture, you see a station that's actually a compound microscope. We have moved one of our dissecting microscopes there. And then there's also one at a uh, vacant desk. Uh, here's a picture of the folks in the Bria lab as they would normally do mosquito testing, uh, probably doing extractions in this picture here. So we're going to start with a timeline in 2020. In late February, it was actually uh, brought to our attention that the lab would be testing for COVID. And this brought up the questions, OK, are they going to be able to test West Nile virus samples? Is the same section of the lab that's doing that? Um, for those of you who have never been here, it's a very, very small uh, section in that lab. And so I was really highly doubting that they were going to be able to uh, test mosquito samples as well. So I started actually talking to Dr. Bowling very early on. Uh, and by March, of course, the lab calls us and says, hey, we can't test your samples. We're over, we're inundated with, you know, uh, COVID samples. And so, uh, you know, we, we actually start testing in April, but DISH starts testing in May. And so we worked out a little deal with uh, Dallas County's LRN. They were, uh, they probably have a bigger lab and more capacity to do things. So they were able to help us out and test our samples um, in April. Uh, by May 1st, we started sending stuff off to DISHES. All right, and so to be able to deal with that, we had to make a few changes. Uh, like I said, we have a homemade system. That homemade system uh, is connected to our laboratory and our management system. Uh, and so we had to modify a lot of data in a lot of different ways. So when Dallas County was testing, we also purchased some compatible tubes and BBs uh, that go with their equipment rather than with ours. Uh, they basically have capacity, they can test X amount per week and anything that they had left over extra, they put our samples in. And so uh, luckily I'm pretty savvy with Excel and was able to create a macro to kind of auto um, manipulate the data to look like theirs or from theirs to look like to go into our system. We did have to upload results manually, but that's not really a problem. There weren't a lot of positives. We did have one in April. Um, and of course, we reported the lab results as uh, our BRIA section usually does. For dishes, again, we developed a compatibility strategy. This, uh, I had to develop multiple macros to be able to modify our data to look like theirs or for theirs to look like ours. And uh, we also reported those lab results and we had to ship our samples over to Austin. All right, so in week 28, stuff started getting very interesting. Our vector index shot up kind of suddenly, and you will be seeing this in the future. Uh, we know that 0.5 for our vector index is pretty bad. This is based on uh, a paper that Wendy Chung had put out. Uh, Dr. Chung is from Dallas County. After the outbreak in 2012, she had reported that 0.5 is bad for overall county data in Dallas. And so we always look at 0.5 as being, okay, there's something going on. Of course, uh, we break up our county into four different quadrants, basically, and our Northeast region was the one of concern. And it usually is, it's our hotspot area, as you heard. Um, Dr. Barrera talking about hotspots. That's that's our West Nile virus hotspot area. Uh, so a week passes and it doesn't get any better. And we don't have any human cases, but we, this starts to be mentioned in commissioner's court by our director. Um, and I, I said, hey, we need to talk to our municipalities and tell them to expand the areas that they're treating. So 
A couple weeks go by, I'm not able to set out that email until two weeks later. So again, uh, this is kind of a delayed process, um, but our, our vector index is creeping up over one in the Northeast, which is which is really bad. And so in week 32, this is when our director started saying, hey, uh, we need to start talking about aerial spraying uh, to the commissioner's court. So uh, average West Nile virus activity, this is over the past seven years prior to 2020. Uh, this is kind of what a normal uh, year looks like. Then the blue area, we have our uh, infection rate and the bars, we have our human cases just by number. And then uh, the orange line is gonna be represented on the right-hand side. That's our vector index. And then the yellow is represented, uh, that's our in incidence rate. Uh, so that's human incidence rate. Uh, I just want you to kind of pay attention to the scales on either for the MLE and human cases, it goes from zero to nine and on the vector index is from zero to five. And here's our 2020 activity, kind of looks like you took our regular activity and squished it up and uh, but it goes very high. And just to give you a, a picture of what this actually looks like compared to our normal, our normal is gonna be on the left-hand side and our 2020s on the right-hand side. And again, our Northeast areas are hotspot. And so the bottom graphs represent uh, the um, MLE, the vector index in human cases from the Northeast. And you can see on that bottom right-hand corner, just how high, I mean, our, our infection rate got as high as, you know, 32, 33 per uh, 10,000, mosquitoes. So that's really, really high as compared to what we normally see. All right. So over the past seven years, we typically see an average of about 289 positive. That's over 5,000 samples per year. That's um, about what we test every single year uh, from 2013 onwards. And as uh, Bethany had po pointed out in 2019, uh, we had virtually no West Nile virus activity. We had just a few positives here and there. And as you can see, uh, 2016 is one of our outbreak years, but we just had less and less activity. And this, um, of course, leaves more birds to be susceptible over time because the ones that are immune are dying and then they're be, being replaced by susceptible. So this was worrisome in 2019. It's not something we didn't see coming. Um, as far as our cases are concerned, uh, you can see at 2012, obviously that was a really bad year for us. We had 280 cases. Uh, something I want to point out is PVD, that's positive viremic donors. These are the folks that are going to donate blood and having positive IgM. Um, of course, we had 11 deaths and Usually we see around 20 cases, uh, but of course in 2016, as I point out, that's another what we consider an outbreak year. Anything that's over 30 or 32 cases, um, we're considering an outbreak. So that was our last really bad year. In 2020, we still so far only have reported 20 cases, but as you can see by our positive iremic donors, which is normally zero to three, we have 12 this year. We're obviously missing a lot of cases and we do have four deaths, but I know that our epis backed up because they're dealing with COVID and they have let me know that there are several cases that are sitting on the desks right now. And who knows what's being missed by the um, medical uh, folks around here as well. All right, so um, this is just, again, I just wanna reiterate how bad 2020 was on that right-hand side. This is only up to week 40. Um, and on the left hand, this is kind of our quote outbreak year. You could see there um, by that MLE is only getting as high as 20 around week 31 uh, in the Northeast portion of the county, but we got it again, as high as 33. Uh, during that same time in 2020. So we're gonna continue on here. During week 33, we're reporting as high as 58 uh, positivities, which which is, you know, the proportion of tests that are coming back, 58% is incredibly high. We don't see that. 40% countywide. Um, so in uh, week 34, we finally got some approval from our commissioner's court um, for aerial application of NALID. However, by this time, we already started uh, decreasing during week uh, 31, that's when we finally again, again, that's two weeks delay. We got to meet with our municipalities who would be affected. Uh, but by week 37, when most people were on board, it was already kind of past when we were, should have been treating. Um, something else that needs to be pointed out for human cases during COVID, less people are going to the doctor. If they are going, they're kind of commuting with their doctor over, over a computer. And so no blood is taken and they're not meeting human uh, case definition by having positive IgM. 
Um, and so, you know, we, we've been talking with our EPI and we just think that it's a great underreporting of cases. Uh, this is the Northeast portion. Uh, all those red circles represent how many positives we had. It's very clear that you can see all the positivity going on in the Northeast as compared to the rest of the county, likely due to riparian habitats surrounded by suburban neighborhoods. So a perfect place for the birds and humans to come together. And that's why it's our hotspot area. And this was the spray area that we had suggested to our municipalities. You can see the affected cities is up in the right-hand corner of that. So a lot of cities, uh, most of them got on board with the exception of one uh, by the end of all this. So in the future, we uh, got some uh, tips from uh, Dr. Qualls. Dr. Qualls said, hey, you need to draw some thresholds. This is, uh, again, as Barrera had, uh, Dr. Barrera had pointed out, it's, it's pretty difficult to do you, especially for disease surveillance. So of course, we're still going to look at our vector index of over 0.5, but for two consecutive weeks, our infection rate over 13, our positivity over 30%. Uh, we're still currently looking at this, so this could uh, change, but this is what we're trying to improve here. Pre-approval from our municipalities, pre-approval from our commissioner's court, and of course, tweak the wording of our response plan to include those thresholds. And we also want to contact our municipalities. And I think that's about all I have since I see you up there, Caroline. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nina. Next up, we have Mr. Steven Hinosa. And thank you everyone for holding questions until um, the end of these four presentations. We'll have a short Q&A before we continue. Hey everybody, can you hear me? We can hear you, we cannot see your screen yet. A test one, two. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, you're good to go. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. I want to thank uh, the center for having me today. Uh, like previously mentioned, I think everyone feels the same way. 2020 was a very unique year uh, for everybody, especially in uh, the public health sector. On our side, I wanted to give some updates, kind of how we were functioning this year compared to other years and kind of some of the updates we've had since the last meeting. So one of our biggest um, obstacles we had this year was since um, we kind of had a double whammy, our Zika funding ended December, 2019. Um, and then so in January, we started training our EPIs to do uh, vector surveillance so that they could replace the functions and operations we had going there and then COVID hit. <laughs> so it was like a double whammy where we had uh, the, uh, our funding stream and our staffing and then also then COVID. So pretty much between February up to September, um, all operations within EPI and vector surveillance was paused for us until October. And that's when we finally have been able to start kind of digging into a couple of things and everything like that. So what I wanted to kind of show is a recap of what we saw um, these past couple of years. Uh, when we look at kind of things like typhus, we could see that uh, probably similarly in common themes that we're gonna see with other zoonotic diseases is a disease that we have really consistent just dropped dramatically. A big piece of that is because we're barely getting back into our disease case investigations, where we're at 31 versus um, over 100 the past couple of years. But a, another piece of that could be the concern that people are just not going to the doctor, they're doing telemedicine, they're not getting um, blood work done. So I think that was a great example with the previous presentation that there's going to be that lack of access to medical care that we're used to seeing within our um, human population. One of the other things that I thought was very interesting is up to as I was getting ready for this PowerPoint, we really didn't have any mosquito-borne illnesses to worry about. And then within just the past couple of weeks, um, we're currently investigating uh, three cases of dengue and seven cases of West Nile. So with our three cases of dengue, um, they're still in the preliminary phases. Uh, two of them had travel history, one to Cancun, Mexico, and the other one to our sister city just south of Estudio de Nosa. Um, and it gets very tricky because since we have a very fluid um, by national population, it's very difficult to ever find a person not go to Enosa or go to Rio Bravo just five minutes south of us. So those do get deemed international, uh, international travel associated. Um, with our seven West Nile cases, of those seven, they've all um, sprouted up within the past three weeks and six of them are neuroinvasive disease. Um, so they're still under investigation. We're getting some trapping efforts done with the cities and municipalities in our um, county health department to try to increase some of the trapping in those major intersections and those um, areas of concern. But the fact that six of the seven are new invasive diseases is definitely showing that it's probably a lot more prevalent out there um, right now in this time of season for us. 
Typically, we see our mosquito-borne illnesses between September, October, and November. So we're right there in that middle phase, at least for this part of South Texas, uh, where we tend to see any type of dengue activity, Zika activity, um, West Nile, St. Louis, or anything else like that. So when we look at our mosquito surveillance activities, what we've been uh, restructuring this year is now that uh, we phased out of our Zika program, we're restructuring with our environmental health program so that we could do a collaborative effort. We rely heavily on our municipalities uh, within Hidalgo County to help us with trapping efforts. We, we have about 22, 23 uh, different divisions of health um, and organizations that help us trap uh, within cities, precincts, and those types of uh, organizations. And so they help us trap uh, throughout the city. And then what we try to do is we try to coordinate the efforts, uh, get everything situated. We're happy to ship any specimens they want to ship um, through us. They drop them off to our office every week, and then we get those shipped out. Because of COVID trapping efforts within Hidalgo County has been limited to almost non-existent since March. So this past month and this past week, especially with the increase in cases, we're looking at increasing our capacity back up these next couple of months um, to finish off the season. Uh, primarily, we focused on live mosquito trapping and past projects um, with uh, CDC and universities. We've had done mosquito egg collections. A lot of it, again, is that collaboration. And then we submit our specimens to both DSHS and university partners, such as UTRGV. And then another piece we have is our South Texas Vector Control Task Force, which is what I'll talk about in a little bit. So when we look at our uh, types of traps we used, we try to use a varied approach. Um, what we're really focusing on and moving forward is to have sentinel sites become more consistent with the type of trap we use so that we have longitudinal data that we can compare month to month. Um, but these are the types of traps we've used in the past. Most commonly because of Zika and Dengue have been BG sentinel traps. Um, we do incorporate light traps, especially when we have flood events. And then whenever we're picking up traps or anything else, we do a lot of backpack aspirating just to try to collect some additional samples. Right now with our West Nile activity, we're getting bringing back out our gravid traps. So we're getting ready for that. And what we haven't touched too much, but we want to start going into this year and next year is our stealth traps on our BG Pro traps. So this is just a snapshot of some, our most common species we've found within the past couple of years. We ended up identifying about 27, 28 species over the past few years. And uh, thanks a huge help to Texas DSHS and UTRGB for helping us with the speciation. Um, these are anything that within the past uh, few years, we've caught a total of 250 or more mosquitoes. So most common types are going to be the flood type, like the Suapa Columbia, where we had a, um, we've been having flood events um, year after year. And then also with our targeted approach with the 80s uh, Egypti and Albopictus. And then um, we do see a, a couple of other types um, like that, um, Culix and others that we see um, commonly when we go trapping. Since we do a lot of targeted approach in um, our, Trapping, we tend to see things that we focus more on a response. So we're having a public health response to Zika cases or dengue cases or West Nile cases. A lot of this is more targeted and um, as she, seen here with the speciation that we're, we're catching. So our South Texas Vector Control Task Force uh, is a multi-county collaborative initiative. It's made up of the counties down here in South Texas within the Rio Grande Valley. And what we've been working on is we've switched to virtual. So early in 2020, we did pause our quarterly meetings. Um, we had one back in July uh, via Zoom uh, so that we could start coordinating our response to Hurricane Hannah. And then we just had one this past week. Um, we've been having environmental health take the lead on that uh, just because uh, we've been so swamped with uh, COVID-19 that we've been so that we could keep operations moving forward. We've been having them help take the lead in those aspects. Since our last meeting, a couple of things I wanted to also talk about was our 2019 rain event. Um, it's, it's kind of uh, humorous because it seems like for the past four years in a row, we've had a hundred year rain event year after year. So um, between 2016, 17, 18, 19, um, we had four massive floods that affected different parts of the county um, where FEMA would have to come down and get involved. And that created a lot of vector control um, coordination, especially for the nuisance population um, doing Hurricane Hannah as well where we also had to make sure that we created vector control efforts to help not only um, protect our community, but our first responders that are trying to help those in need. So back in 2019, we did some collections on the first week and second week of July to kind of look at what kind of nuisance mosquito population we were looking at. And we had seven light trap uh, locations that we placed with CO2. 
Um, and we had our cities and municipalities also help us um, in these areas. And just to kind of look down at the breakdown, we definitely saw a huge increase in that flood water species between July 1st and July 3rd, um, compared to the second week where we saw that population die off. So we ended up catching over 20,000 uh, mosquitoes that first week, and then that population dropped down to um, just 429 the following week. When we looked at the, that flood event, um, what we ended up seeing is again, that decrease uh, in the mosquito population, generally speaking, but especially in the flood water mosquitoes. Um, but yet we had a small increase in our 80s and culex species, showing that that population was kind of going back to normal or what we would see on a uh, general population standpoint. One of the other things that we've been working on has been um, collaborate, cl collaborating with different partners with our research initiatives. Um, we've been working very closely with the state and UTRGV on a vector surveillance uh, publication. Um, so we are actively working, um, adjusting, rewriting that, strengthening it um, for future submission. But one thing we were able to get uh, submitted during all this chaos of COVID-19 was an article on our Zika testing within Hidalgo County. And it was kind of funny because we were really interested in this um, journal with tropical medicine and infectious disease, but we were so busy with COVID that we, uh, we just bit the bullet, sat down, tried to get as much stuff as we can um, submitted. Um, and then we just strengthened it, tweaked it um, as they allowed us to, and thankfully just got published about um, two months ago. So in this um, study, what we really focused on was looking at our antenatal Zika testing um, in response um, and in preparation of Zika outbreaks. So we looked at the types of testing within our human population, um, especially our pregnant population, the effects of public health advisories. Um, so on the bottom graph, you can see how uh, testing just overall rapidly increased as the state came out with their public health alert for the need of pregnant women testing. So down here in the valley, um, our, our first public health alert focused on the need for all pregnant women to get tested for Zika. And then the second public health alert focused more on the need for PCR testing once every trimester. So overall, um, during our 2017 um, outbreak where we saw locally acquired Zika, we ended up identifying eight cases of Zika. Um, six of those were pregnant. And then of those that were asymptomatic infection, additional 10 or seven were pregnant. So our main scope on this and focus was to show that the importance of having this type of population testing did help identify uh, the type of uh, susceptible population we had within our community, but it also helped in control efforts where we worked with our environmental and our vector control departments without, um, throughout the county so that we could make sure we had um, adequate public health inter intervention and control measures. And uh, I like to always focus on the different types of collaborations. One of the things I love about public health is you're always working with so many different partners, whether it's university partners, cities, municipalities, um, national organizations, state, state departments, and other local health departments. It's something that we're always working with um, hand in hand. And I think this is just a small snapshot of all those people that are helping us out. Some of the other projects that we um, do work with is with CSTE and UC Davis, where we look at mosquito um, abundance likelihood and computer modeling um, for the presence of Aedes aegypti and Albopictus. Um, we also work with um, Texas A&M University on some projects down here in the valley as well with um, education and mosquito presence. And also of course with UTRGV and others where they've been a huge help in making sure that we are able to fit the need of our population. I think one of the biggest limitations before um, Zika came about a few years ago was the presence of vector education and vector um, ability just down here in our community. So UTRGV and the Center of Excellence have been able to be a huge help um, in helping our community with that. Some of our future goals we have for the year um, and the years to come is we definitely want to sustain our sentinel sites. Um, we, uh, COVID knocked us off our feet um, on our vector surveillance program for a little bit, but we're excited and ready to get back on board over the next couple of months as we transition back in. Um, we also want to be able to increase our submission of mosquito samples. I think uh, if we compare our submissions from previous years where we had about 30, 31,000 samples of mosquitoes submitted, this year we were down to only like about 100 or 200. And the other thing is we're really looking at one thing that did come good out of COVID-19, unfortunately, but fortunately was um, our capacity for space. So when we had our Zika grant, we kind of joke around with it, but it is shows the need of public health um, infrastructure is we had our 10 Zika techs in a makeshift closet. So they were all like working out of the same closet, um, showing desks and all of this stuff. And then when COVID-19 came around, 
we grew our team from about 15, 20 people to about 60 to 70. So it was a huge response um, to the cases that we were seeing. We ended up being a very large hotspot. Um, unfortunately, we're approaching 2,000 deaths now, but it's one of those where um, we saw also the need for space. People were sharing desks, a lot of things where social distancing couldn't take place, and we had no remote capacity. So in the years to come, we're currently working on building a public health laboratory. We're one of the largest uh, health departments without one. So we're working with um, engineering, architects, and everything. Um, we have thankfully secured funding to have a public health laboratory for the future that will uh, provide space for us um, to be able to grow our programs. And with that, the one thing I just wanted to end on with is one of our team members, um, Erwin Salazar, was an amazing team member that we had uh, here as part of our center program and that's here at our Hidalgo County family. He did unfortunately lose his uh, fight with COVID, but we wanna thank him for all the years with both Hidalgo County and the city of McAllen for everything and his commitment to public health. With that, I wanna thank y'all uh, for allowing me to be here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Great presentation. And thank you for remembering Mr. Salazar as well. Um, with that, we will change gears a little bit. A Q&A session for our last four speakers. Um, just a reminder, that was Dr. Peck, Dr. Bowling, uh, Ms. Nina Daco, and Mr. Um, I think we had a couple questions come in the chat box, but I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Roundy. Thanks, Caroline. Um, we did have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, the first two for um, Dr. Peck. This is a short Q&A, so let's try to get through these questions relatively quickly. Um, the first question is from Michelle Downey, and she asks, um, you're mentioning now about competitive exclusion of pathogens with regards to um, R. amblyommatis. Um, it's extremely interesting to me. She'd be interested or eager to know more about any work taking place along these lines. Um, Michelle, I would point you to that um, paper by Kirk Carpatrick, I think is the primary author. Um, if you email me, um, I can send the entire citation to you and competitive exclusion is just part and parcel of the ecological literature. So I'm happy to send other citations as well. Uh, another question for Dr. Peck from um, uh, Nina Daka. Um, she asks, do you think that the, spine, the Texas spiny lizard's blood may clear Borrelia, as does the Western fence lizard in California? You may be muted, Dr. Peck. Thank you, Dr. Weaver. Um, yeah, the answer to Nina is I don't know. Um, these systems have co-evolved for millions of years. There's probably something in the fence lizard that protects it from Borrelia. Um, and um, I know it's in the literature, but I haven't looked at it in a number of years. Our last question in the chat is from uh, Jason Fritz for Nina. Uh, Jason asks, oh, what was the pushback from city declining aerial spraying? Is it more related to the use of the aerial pesticide, the costs, or a combination of the two? Okay, so uh, through through the rushing that I was doing there, uh, one of the municipalities that did push back actually had sprayed in 2012, one of the very few cities that sprayed in Tarrant County. And it, would, it wasn't anything to do with cost. Our actual commissioners agreed to pay for half of all the spray event, um, which means that the city would only pay for half. And it, that wasn't an issue. Really what it was, was all the pushback that they got from their uh, let's just say more than well-off um, public um, about aerial applications. I think it's just a misunderstanding of, of uh, how little pesticide we spray and what the risks are. And it looks like we have one more question from Dr. Weaver. You're muted, Dr. Weaver. Uh, yeah, this question is for Dr. Bowling. Perhaps others may also uh, have information. I'm interested in uh, Eastern equine encephalitis in Texas. 
As you know, uh, last year was an unprecedented year uh, US-wide for human cases, especially in the Northeast and uh, the uh, Midwest, Northern Midwest areas. Can you tell me, was there any indication of increased activity in Texas? And also, uh, over the, the long term, what have we learned about what mosquitoes in Texas may be the main vectors and what the distribution of the virus is in our state? Hi, this is Bethany. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So we actually did detect uh, Eastern in about six horses um, last year in Texas. Um, and they were mostly in the Eastern part of Texas. Um, there was some a little bit more North, as I recall. Um, and we did not detect it in any mosquitoes, but we did have quite a few requests because there were horse cases, um, there, were there was trapping done um, around those horse cases, but we didn't detect it in any mosquitoes. So we definitely saw an uptick in activity uh, based on the horses, but uh, no mosquito detections last year. Um, as far as species, we've only detected Eastern in a few species, and I think it was I think in the 90s, the last time we detected Tripoli and mosquitoes. And as I recall, it was Aedes albopictus. Uh, it was one of the pools. And then the other one, um, I think it was an 80s species. I can't recall. Um, but as far as this, the mosquito species uh, participating, I think it's difficult because we don't get enough uh, collections to test. So it's hard for us to really get an idea of what species are participating. Um, but obviously we do have it circulating and as you know in Galveston in years past you've had the sentinel chickens that have zero converted for Tripoli there. Uh, we haven't seen that in a few years but I know it's been there um, and then obviously we've had horse cases. Um, we usually have a couple every year but we, we did have more last year. I don't think we had any uh, this year that I'm aware of. Um, so I think, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of knowledge about the species that are playing a role in transmission, and that's something that would be good to look into more. Bethany, do you ever receive any Culicida melanora for testing? I think we have, but I've been at this lab for six years, and I have not seen one. So I think it's very rare. I know we have a couple in our little reference collection, so we have received a few. Um, but it's not something that we get in uh, very often. Thank you. All right, we are out of time for this Q&A session. It looks like Dr. Estrada had a question for Dr. Bowling and um, Stephen Hinosa. If you guys wouldn't mind reaching out to him in the chat or via email to address that, that would be appreciated. Um, with that, back to you, Caroline. All right, thank you for those questions. We'll be continuing our public health session, which includes Mr. Chris Fredergill from Harris County, Ms. Cynthia Bates from Oklahoma City County Health Department, Ms. Ra Raquel Castillo from Cameron County, and Ms. Yaziri Gonzalez from City of Brownsville. Mr. Fredergill, if you could please share your video and then your screen as well. Uh-oh. This worked like five minutes ago. <laughs> we can see your video. Good, so we're making some progress. Let's see. There it goes. Can you see it? Yes, if you could just share it in presenter view. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, sorry about that, y'all. Okay. So I'm Chris Fredergill, uh, director here at Harris County Public Health Mosquito Vector Control Division. Today, I was just going to talk to you all a little bit about uh, kind of our general program overview and the progress that we've made this year and in a COVID year, which is quite an accomplishment in and of itself. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so those of you that don't know where Harris County is, uh, it's basically the county that uh, houses Houston, which is our third largest or our uh, third most our fourth largest city in the country and our, we're the third most populous county in the, in the uh, country. Um, we're about 1,800 square miles, 1,778. We have 56 species of mosquitoes 
we have over 25 at, uh, active homeowner associations, which are also contracting out and, and doing pest control services as well, along with a lot of, uh, we have about 38 cities and municipalities with the smattering of, of mosquito control efforts within. Um, our mission is basically to protect the health and well being of our residents through an integrated vector management program. Uh, and primarily, we're concerned with St. Louis encephalitis and West Nile virus, but we're also testing for a lot of the other imported cases that we get, such as dengue, uh, chikungunya, Zika, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that being said, our primary vectors are Culex quinquefasciatus, which is our vector for St. Louis encephalitis and West Nile virus. Um, uh, Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti, which are the vectors obviously of dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. Um, so we've kind of changed our slogan a little bit from fight the bite to prevent the bite day and night. Um, and that's to basically address the daytime biting habits of the 80s mosquitoes as well. So what does an integrated vector management uh, program look like? It's basically three primary components, but we have a, a little pyramid here. So we have a prevention, which is our education outreach and our source reduction efforts. Then we have our detection, which is all our surveillance and our virology. And then we have intervention. And generally what we do to intervene is our biological controls um, and larviciding. So we use um, BTI, Bacillus spiricus, things like that. Um, and then last, we have our chemical controls, um, which is our adulticiding. We, we only go and adulticide under two conditions. If we have confirmed mosquito-borne disease in an area through our surveillance efforts, or if it's a declared disaster and the nuisance populations are interfering with response and recovery. Along with that comes a record keeping insecticide resistance monitoring to make sure what we're doing works and just continuous program evaluation to make sure that we're returning uh, that value to our residents. This is just a general, this is how we have it broken up here. So our prevention efforts are our education outreach and our inspection, our detection obviously is surveillance and virology and our intervention are our adult and larval controls and uh, our insecticide resistance and applied research is kind of our evaluation piece. So you can see we're going out and doing all kinds of things in the community. I really just like to add animations. We'll go into these a little more detail. Um, so our education section, what do they do? They go out in the communities, they go to schools, uh, they offer operational tours to all kinds of people. They do staff development, CE workshops. Uh, we're for very fortunate to work with AgriLife and the centers for our CEU workshops. We have a very successful one here. Uh, we've also very recently uh, begun a regional vector control network where we're trying to bring all of our vector control partners in our general area together so that we can kind of coordinate activities and share information. Um, our annual workshop has been moved to virtual this year, December 9th. Um, unfortunately, we had to cancel our three-day uh, master vector certification classes, but we look forward to hopefully things returning not to normal, but to a new better in the near future so that we can resume these in person, because I think there's a huge benefit to these as well. Um, our, our residents can obviously report uh, any kind of activity. They can report dead birds. They can uh, request an inspection. They can check where our, we have disease activity and spray areas. They can do all of this on our mobile application. We're very proud of that. If they want to request any services, they can do that via phone, via the application, or they can go to the website. So we try to be as available as possible to our residents. Um, whenever they request a service, we'll send out an inspector if they're requesting an inspection of their property. And so we generally try to meet with the person um, and then we'll fan out after that inspection and look for any kind of breeding habitats in the general area. Uh, and we'll try to eliminate those through simple source reduction or larviciding if we can. We're also pretty heavily involved with any kind of epidemiological investigations. Um, so our epis are very good about including us in their investigations so we can get out there and, and see what's going on mosquito wise. And they oversee the post-disaster landing rate counts. As far as our surveillance, which is our detection piece, we have four primary areas, mosquito surveillance, our avian surveillance, which are live and dead birds, uh, our virology group, and our other vectors, um, which we're, we're just kind of started expanding into now. Um, so that's really exciting. With our mosquito surveillance, we go out, we have the county broken up into 268 operational areas. You'll see that on the next slide. We go out, we set traps, we bring those back, we sort them, we, we identify them, we sort them, we group them into pools, and then we send them over to our virology lab for disease detection. And this is just a couple of comparisons between last year and this year. You can see we're, fortunately we have a large enough staff to where uh, we were able to actually reallocate resources. So our, our core functions, which is our mosquito surveillance 
and our interventions, which is our adult deciding and our education operations, um, were not as majorly affected as some of our, our other areas. Um, so you can see we're right on on task with uh, with last year, right on par with it. Um, so this this year so far, we pulled about 306 females. We've identified about a half million of them, and we've got about um, 8,000 traps set, uh, which is really good. Um, so here's our, our county. You can see we use three primary traps. We use a CDC light trap that we place down in storm sewers. We use a gravid trap, and we also use a biogen sentinel trap. And this is just a general layout of how these uh, traps are laid out around the county. We're also uh, partnering with Microsoft again this year. We, I'm sure you all are, are uh, have heard about it by now because we won't stop talking about it. So um, we, uh, we're really excited about that. I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, with our bird surveillance, we go out, we trap live birds, we set up Japanese mist nets, we trap live birds, we take a little cirrus sample, we band them so that we have some some historical information on them. You can see here, um, and then we also go out and we collect our dead birds as well. Our dead birds, you can see how many we've gone out and uh, we get about 100, 150, 200 calls depending on the interest. Uh, we go out and we collect most of them. They obviously have to be in good condition and then we test most of what we collect. We've only had one positive uh, in our bird samples the last two years, and that was this year in, in July-ish, I believe. Uh, our virology uh, section, they actually go out, or they go out, they go to their laboratory, um, and they uh, test our mosquito samples for these um, diseases, West Nile virus, St. Louis encephalitis primarily, and then we also test for Zika, dengue, and chikungunya. And again, you can see the number of pools that we've tested. We're not that far off from last year. Uh, COVID did actually delay the start of the season by about two to three weeks, but um, we got up and running really, really quickly with reallocating uh, employees. Last year, we had 25 uh, positive uh, pools for West Nile virus. This year, we only have 23. Um, so that's somewhat concerning for the, the coming years because of all of the points that have been mentioned earlier with the, with the bird, um, the naive bird populations. Uh, with our vector surveillance group, um, mosquitoes aren't the only threat, right? So we have a bunch of other vectors here as well, lucky us. Um, we started looking at kissing bugs in 2016. We've trailed off on those a little bit just because they're very difficult to find. And we, we end up getting about one to two kissing bugs a year. Our ticks have been uh, much more surprising to me. I thought we had honestly concreted and fire anted our ticks away. Um, but I'm pretty we're, we've been pretty surprised with the numbers that we've actually collected. Um, and then we're looking at, at possibly uh, expanding out into fleas, but we really don't want to handle any kind of live animals. And so we're looking at some trapping methodologies and things to see if we can move into that without touching animals. Um, as far as our tick uh, collections, these are the last shipment. Uh, Dr. Boyer's lab has is, is been very helpful in testing a lot of our ticks. And so these are the ticks from that we've collected from last year until now. Of course, we had planned to to drop off a, a load of ticks and COVID happened. So now we've all been um, waiting for everything to kind of stabilize a little more uh, so that we can go drop some of these off. And these are just a breakdown of the species, right? The Gulf Coast tick, the Lone Star tick are, are the primary ticks that we're collecting. We do have uh, one Exodes Texanus, which is a raccoon tick, which is really cool. Uh, we're excited about that. We, we actually, Dr. Teal and his lab at AM were very helpful in identifying this and working with us on this as well. Um, so we'll move into our adult, uh, our adult control efforts. And again, we only go out and treat if we have confirmed mosquito-borne disease or declared disaster. Um, we're working with uh, Microsoft this year. And basically we have this new trap or the trap that they've designed. Now we're trying to get them to network together so they can give us a real-time situational awareness of what's going on mosquito-wise, hoping to move into predictive analytics. So we're really excited to work on this aspect of it as well. Um, our control measures uh, for adults are primarily geared towards uh, ground-based. And for our Culex, that's primarily truck-based, as you can imagine. And then if we were uh, to to have to get out to treat any of the 80s, we can also treat from ground. We have handheld thermal foggers and, and uh, ULVs and some backpack sprayers as well so that we can go out and treat. Because as you all know, the 80s mosquitoes, Albopictus and Aegypti are primarily in backyards. They're not really a public space uh, mosquito. 
Um, and then we also have aerial uh, capabilities. This is not our plane. Um, that's actually the Air Force's plane. Uh, we contract out a lot of those services whenever they're needed. Um, we also have a couple of new novel measures that we're trying to get out, which is the WALS technique, which is a, a wide area larvicidal application of BTI. We're really looking forward to getting this out there. And, and this is to address those, those cryptic breeding habitats of those 80s uh, Aegypti and 80s Albopictus mosquitoes. Um, we also own a drone. Unfortunately, this red sash here represents all of the red tape that we have been unable to break through as of yet. So uh, we're hoping to get all of our necessary certificates and everything so that we can get these up in the air. As you can imagine, Harris County is a pretty crowded airspace. And so there's a lot of hoops to jump through in order to fly drones uh, in this airspace. Um, public notification, this is where we basically let our residents know where there's disease activity or where and where we plan to treat. Um, you can see this year, 2020 was a very bizarre year. Usually West Nile virus is more spread out across the county, but for the last two years, it's been very concentrated. In 2019, it was concentrated inside the inner loop area. I hope you all can see my arrow. If not, it's gonna be meaningless to you, but it was really focused in this area and we had 25. This year, it was, it was focused up here in the Northwest and we only had 23. We're still trying to figure out what's going on. We're working with our partners to try to model this stuff out and, and try to get some kind of handle on it. But these are actually updated as soon as we decide. Once we input in our database that, we, that a, a sample is positive, it will populate this map and the same with the proposed treatment. Once we decide and assign the area, it'll populate in here as well. Um, the continuous program evaluation piece and improvement is very important. I look at our insecticide resistance monitoring as that because we're constantly out trying to identify insecticide resistance so that we can determine if we need any additional um, intervention strategies other than Dr. our uh, insecticides, which we've been uh, very focused on for uh, 50 years now. Um, Dr. So, Fredrigil, you're yes. out of time. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, well, anyways, we're doing some applied research. Uh, we have an x-ray machine. Uh, innovation and collaboration. We are very grateful to be part of the Center of Excellence. We're involved in Project 1, 2, 3, and 4, which are the ticks, the outreach, um, the evaluation of vector interventions, and the impact of insecticide resistance. Um, here's, a mic here's a pretty picture of Microsoft. Here are our partnerships. If any of you guys were, would like uh, volunteers, please send them our way. Unfortunately, we had to end it for this year, but we're hoping to pick it up next year. And if anyone is looking for work, we have some open positions. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Chris. Sorry to rush you there at the end. That's OK. <laughs> All right, up next we have uh, Cynthia Bates, I believe. If you could please share your video and then share your screen. OK, uh, I shared my video. Can you see it? Yes. OK, OK. Great, we can see your presentation. Okay, all right. So uh, my name is Cynthia Bates. I'm an epidemiologist at the Oklahoma City County Health Department. I will be uh, presenting this on behalf of Trey Williams, who is the mosquito program coordinator for the health department. All right, so first I'll go over uh, an overview of uh, Oklahoma City County Health Department, uh, its jurisdiction. Um, also some of the mosquito program components, uh, an overview of some of the data we've collected so far for the 2020 season. Um, this week was the last week of collection, so we're, we're still uh, looking at the data. Um, go over some of the challenges we had this season due to COVID, and then review the, uh, the two interns that Trey was able to work with uh, during the 2020 season. So the Oklahoma City County Health Department includes uh, Oklahoma City and Oklahoma County in its jurisdiction. So that expands across about three different counties in central Oklahoma and 16 different municipalities. It, it serves more than uh, 750,000 residents um, and over a million people that commute within what we call the Oklahoma City metro area. For our mosquito program, 
uh, we usually trap and do most of the work for May through October. Um, the program includes trapping, uh, some identification and testing, habitat surveys, uh, human disease surveillance, uh, and education and outreach. Unfortunately, this uh, season we have had to limit our education and outreach efforts due to COVID. Usually we have our mascot, Tito the Mosquito, go out to events during the summer uh, to uh, just kind of bring awareness to the community on um, uh, prevention and uh, certain steps they can take uh, during the West Nile season. So in order for us to do trapping, since our program is relatively small, uh, not many people within the health department actually work with the mosquito program, we really rely on our municipal partners, um, uh, two in particular that maintain and set the traps every week. Uh, most of the traps we use are the CDC gravit traps. Uh, we are able to use in some instances these um, like doghouse like structures to protect them from um, rainfall and, and some other things, which makes it easier to identify the mosquitoes after they've been frozen. Um, the municipalities bring us the nets, we sort them, test them for West Nile, and all of the counts and positive uh, pool information is then sent to the municipalities that same day so that um, they can take uh, certain steps um, for uh, like habitat remediation. So uh, like I mentioned uh, earlier, this week was the, the last week of uh, trapping. Uh, so we just uh, collected our data um, a couple days ago for this week. Um, this graph shows the number of Culex and Aedes mosquitoes that we've trapped each trapping week. Uh, at the beginning of the season, we started with most uh, with about the same number of Aedes and Culex mosquitoes. And then from um, about the end of June to mid-September, there were more uh, Culex mosquitoes than Aedes. And this graph just shows the number of positive pools per week. We had a couple of weeks earlier in the season where we had positive pools and then the rest of them were um, from mid-July to September. And only seven out of the 17 traps that we had set out this season uh, had positive pools. Um, six of them were the gravid traps and then one of them was the uh, BG Sentinel trap that we have set out. So whenever there is a positive pool reported at a trap site, we notify uh, the respective municipality. Usually um, in certain situations, they're able to go out to do a habitat survey of the area around the trap, uh, decide whether or not uh, larvicide should be applied um, or if any other uh, habit habitat remediation efforts need to take place. Um, some other habitat surveys that we do are uh, public complaints. So the um, Department of uh, Food Safety and Environmental uh, Protection, uh, they receive these complaints from the public. They go out and just observe, provide education and information. In rare instances, they treat the water. So if the property is vacant, um, uh, they are able to do that. And also in extreme circumstances, they can start a citation procedure. So if the person is not uh, fixing the problem after a few days or weeks or so, then they can start the citation uh, process. And uh, this graph displays the number of complaints that were reported this season by month uh, compared to the number of mosquitoes that were trapped. And as you can see, most of the complaints were, uh, lots of the complaints were reported uh, earlier in the season when we didn't have as many mosquitoes uh, trapped. And that's usually the case. Um, in the past few years, we have seen that. And we also received a, a bit fewer complaints than we normally do. And we, we may attribute that to COVID uh, because people were mostly submitting complaints for you know, mass compliance and that sort of thing. And mosquitoes weren't really um, a high priority. 
uh, human disease surveillance. Um, you know, we, the state receives uh, lab reports and assigns it out to the county. Um, and then we do the case investigation. Uh, this season, we did have a couple of uh, West Nile cases. Last season, we didn't have any reported in our county. So whenever we do get a positive case, um, we notify the environmental health division uh, they send someone out to do a neighborhood survey where they pass out information to the community and then look for any stagnant water body sites that, um, that, that they may identify. For one of the cases, um, it was uh, determined that the, the person had a lot of buckets in their yard that they weren't dumping out. Um, so that, that created a, an issue with mosquitoes in that area. Um, the communications department uh, released a, a press release to the public reminding them that it is West Nile virus season and that they should be taking the appropriate precautions. Um, again, because of uh, COVID, we uh, some individual uh, people in the community kind of uh, put West Nile out of their minds. Uh, so they weren't really uh, thinking about it or taking the uh, appropriate precautions like they normally would have. All right. <clears throat> the first uh, trapping year for uh, our health department was in 2013 after the 2012 West Nile virus outbreak. Um, each season after that, we've added uh, trapping weeks and the number of traps. Um, like I mentioned last season, we didn't have any human cases, but we had quite a few positive uh, pools and positive weeks. Um, this season, we had a couple of human cases, um, but not as many positive pools detected. All right, and with all the data that we collect on a weekly basis, we release the Skeeter meter on social media and on our website. It's just an awareness tool to, um, to inform the public on where we are that week in terms of mosquitoes. Um, and I believe this season, the highest meter values for, were for mid-June to September, um, but overall they were not uh, relatively high this season. All right, so for uh, this, the challenges that we had in 2020, lots of them started because of COVID. One of, uh, like I mentioned, we did, weren't able to do uh, community events with the mascot. Uh, there weren't as many uh, social media campaigns released uh, related to West Nile like we normally do. And also one of the municipalities that assist us backed out because their code enforcement officers had to focus on of responding to complaints um, in their community regarding COVID. So that they were responsible for seven of the trapping sites. So in order to, to kind of fill in that gap, um, one of the, uh, the, the Western Gulf interns helped a tremendous amount with the, the trapping, testing, monitoring of those sites and uh, Trey was also able to develop a partnership with the local university, um, University of Central Oklahoma, and they provided two interns um, uh, that use the work kind of as a school credit. Usually the students um, end of program requirements requires more work than what we were able to do with the traps, but because of COVID, uh, they were able to get school approval to allow the students to conduct the trapping work as a special project for a graduation requirement. Um, fortunately, uh, we were able to add one municipality, a new municipal partner, um, and they uh, they added one trap in their area. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't uh, set up until later in the season, but it did uh, trap a, a good number of mosquitoes and we're hoping to continue um, that partnership uh, into the, the next season. Okay, 
And now for uh, the two interns that Trey was able to work with this season, one is uh, Macy uh, from Texas A&M University. Uh, he said she did a phenomenal job working with us during his time. this time. Um, she helped Trey get through all of the, the issues surrounding one of the municipalities backing out at the last minute. Uh, she helped with trapping, sorting, testing, um, and unfortunately, she wasn't able to see all the public education and awareness um, activities that we normally do, but she was able to compensate that by doing uh, uh, assisting with stagnant water complaints in the county. Um, and then the other is uh, Linda Wolf uh, from OU. Um, Linda was great at the tick work that she conducted with Dr. Ketchum. Trey was able to attend some of the uh, collection days and help a couple times. And in that time, he was able to learn, uh, he learned how time consuming tick collection really is. He learned the flagging method, CO2 baiting, as well as tick identification. Um, and so this was a crucial piece in our health department's vector control because we did not have a program for ticks. So with the partnership and the information gained, from the time working with uh, Linda and Dr. Ketchum. Uh, we look forward to continuing work with OU and uh, on possibly having a TIC uh, project or program for seasons to come. All right. And we have Yazari Gonzalez. Now, can you see that screen? Is yes, we can. We can't okay. see you, but we can see your presentation. Okay. Perfect. Um, so um, my name is Yaciri Gonzalez. I am the new medical entomologist for the city of Brownsville. And when I mean new, I just started on Monday. Um, and I am pleased to update you with the progress that we have done here uh, with our program. Okay, so in 2017, um, the city of Brownsville did a strength, weaknesses, and opportunity threat analysis to their program, and they identified needs um, in that program. And so we just wanted to mention that we have not lost focus on those necessities, and we cannot stress the importance of continuous reevaluation re of our program. So we are continuously um, looking at this as the seasons pass by. And so with our uh, limitations needs uh, and needs addressed in that um, SWOT, um, we did um, address some of the issues that we found. So um, through DSHS, um, we were able to acquire an entomologist, which would be me. And then we were also able with a Title V to continue funding our ep epidemiologists and with our CARES Act, um, we were able to continue funding uh, our nurse analyst. Um, and with that, um, we are still having some uh, limitations that we're still seeing in our program. Um, we have delayed testing results. You know, it takes time from collection to um, actually getting our test results as we have to send them um, out to Austin. Um, and also the poverty levels and living conditions um, may not be fully representative of other areas in the state since we do have a very low income um, in, within the community. Um, and also um, loss of essential staff affects uh, our door-to-door -door outreach um, to our community. So, you know, we don't have the ability to reach as many people as we would like to. So, you know, the worlds before COVID-19, our plan was to, uh, it was, uh, to address our cooperative agreement plan um, and, with that plan, we were hoping to implement the use of novel management tactics, which includes the use of, the dro of a drone, um, diversify our trapping methods uh, for adult mosquitoes, and also acquire an in-house entomologist to assist and address uh, needs in the testing laboratory. Um, and because, you know, we do have to send our samples out to different, we have to send, we collect total of 54 samples weekly and 30 of those go to state for testing. And then um, a big thank you to our, Dr. Vitek at, 
UTRGV for taking the remaining 24. Um, Dr. Bowling has done an amazing job also in state in processing our samples, but there is a lag time for on-site preventative measures. And we want to you know, address those in-house. Um, we do, again, we want to not only expand our adult, uh, our adult trapping, but we also want to do um, egg and larval collections to see um, what's, what we're having in not only terrestrial, but like in aquatic measures. Um, we want to uh, continue working uh, and reevaluating, as I had mentioned, our program to see what are the needs of our community, where can we step up and you know, close that gap uh, between community and us as, as public health officials. Um, uh, and also, we also want to continue working in securing long-term uh, professional assets. As uh, many of you know, like it is funding, so we want to have solid funding to continue um, to assure that we have staff needed. Um, and so as I had mentioned, we did have the COAC funding. And with that, we were able to get two truck mounted cougars, um, backpack sprayers, a vortex spreader, um, this amazing little drone, the mother of all drones, as we like to call her, where um, we it is able to use, uh, it is able to uh, spread adulticide and larvicide. And so this past June, and this past June, we uh, used the cougars and the backpack sprayers. So we were very fortunate in doing that. Um, the Vortex spreader was also a great addition. It helped us deliver product along waterways and small flooded areas. And the drone has not been used due to COVID-19 delays in our training and FA processing, um, but we were able to um, get some things done in August. So um, we were able to get some work. Progress. We were able to get some progress done with the drone. Um, the drone will not only help us uh, determine exact areas where we need uh, treatments, but also apply those adulticides and larvicides. And then life after COVID, um, like most agencies around the nation, um, our offices shut down in March and we didn't reopen until late May. Um, some of our staff was exposed, therefore we were limited in our day-to-day -day operations. Um, the state laboratory had limited operations as well, so therefore our ID and testing was not in full force. Um, luckily in June, um, we did not have our typical, we did have our typical flooding, but it wasn't as severe as previous years. And to end this very depressing part of the slide, I wanted to go on to a more positive note where we did make progress in getting the drone off the ground. So we did get our FFA certificate of authorization um, in, <laughs> in August 14th, and then we completed our drone training um, the 18th. And then um, after this, we will have mo uh, monthly trainings on our drone operations. So what's next for Brownsville? Well, the season is not over here in Brownsville. As uh, mentioned in our previous presenter, yet, uh, yesterday we received notification that there might be four potential Zika slash Dengue cases in the city. So what we did yesterday, surveillance increased in the areas where the cases were reported and traps were set out yesterday. Um, we are sending those samples uh, from those traps today and tomorrow to Dr. Bowling for testing and adulticides and larvicide applications will occur post trapping after those two collections are made. And so since we're having uh, these cases so late in the season when, you know, typically we're supposed to end our season in December, we continue to, we hope to continue to surveillance and have identification occur in-house to determine potential vectors that are in our area in real time. And with that, um, as I had mentioned before, aside from you know, bringing in-house identification. Um, we hope to expand our surveillance, our surveillance efforts aside from adults to eggs and larvae. Um, and what we hope to do also, you know, 
due to COVID setbacks, we want to review our data collection, our previous data collections and virus reports to have those fully up and ready to go. Um, we did see some um, issues with our mosquito reporting website in which all of the years are archived in the same page as our new occurring cases. Um, and we do want to continue educating the community on mosquito prevention. Um, this morning, we had a wonderful team of 12 people go out there and go out there and uh, Oh, we, we had a, a team go out there and pass uh, over 700 bags um, dealing with Zika, um, information on Zika and how it's uh, in its vector, um, and which was amazing. I mean, we had, to, everyone was out there around six in the morning. It was, it was awesome. Um, we also, I know Dr. Bowling had stopped her bioassay, her bottle of bioassays in the state, but we hope to eventually uh, perform those here in Brownsville of the products being used in um, the city. And then ultimately we do want to have a functioning and self-sustaining mosquito processing lab here in Brownsville. Um, and also we hope to continue discussion with Dr. Ron Tyler and being part of his response team since we, we are equipped and we can fulfill those uh, needs for his team. And with that, we'd like to thank you all for inviting us uh, to speak today. Um, the city of Brownsville, uh, Dr. Mutebi and everyone else <laughs> listed on here. I, it would take me another five minutes. I don't think you guys want that to explain, but um, yeah, thanks very, I mean, thanks to everyone on this. And then here in our last slide, this is our wonderful team. We do need to update this because as you previously mentioned, we did, as I previously mentioned, we did acquire a lot of equipment, so we just want to we just want to showcase how proud we are of that. Thank you so much, Yazri. Great presentation, and thank you to all of our public health partners for their presentations today. We'll now begin a Q and A for the entire public health session, um, but especially our last four speakers. Um, so I will hand it over to Dr. Roundy. Thanks, Caroline. It looks like we have plenty of time for questions. Um, does anyone have questions for our um, public health group speakers? Looks like our first question is coming from Dr. Weaver. Good afternoon. This is for the, the last two speakers about the Zika cases down in the Valley. Uh, can you tell us how those initial diagnoses were made? Were they made with PCR based on the triplex assay, where were the assays done? So I'm um, gonna, yeah. I was gonna let Ms. Castillo answer that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So they were IGM um, done at the provider's offices at commercial labs, and then they were forwarded by the commercial labs to the CDC lab and where they did the PRNT. Okay, so those are based all on serology. There were no virus detections made? Correct. Thank you. This, this is Doug Watts in El Paso. Hi, Dr. Watts, did you have a question? A comment and a question, maybe a combination. Uh, mosquito control, I... Uh, I've been in this field for 50 plus years and I keep looking for a mosquito control strategy that really works. And not to say that there haven't, hasn't been an effort, but, but uh, I look back and, and I think of three, three situations, Cuba, uh, back in, in the days of Gorgas, uh, yellow fever, and Singapore. Those are the only three examples I know where there was actually an effective uh, control strategy for Aedes aegypti, but they all have since failed. And I have been still wondering if we are ever gonna have a really effective mosquito control program. and and. You know, I read the literature and it says, oh, this uh, this particular 
uh, strategy works. But yeah, it worked to to uh, suppress the mosquito population. But you never see that, and it says it actually reduced the uh, the virus population. Other than for my good friend and and colleague Dr. Barra, I know that uh, they have done some of these studies in Puerto Rico. So I'd like to hear what he uh, what he thinks about my comments. I'm not sure if Dr. Brera is online any longer. Okay, yes, maybe uh, anybody else out there have any uh, oh. any comments about vector control programs and strategies? Yeah, I, I would like to. Yeah, I would like to comment. Uh, that that's a very important question. Uh, as you say, uh, there are not very uh, many examples of. Uh, current successful uh, control of Aedes aegypti uh, in particular. Um, you know, I think that we haven't had for a very long time the tools to understand the, the what I was talking about this morning, the, what is the minimum, minimum number of mosquitoes that we need to keep at bay so we don't have these outbreaks. If you Think of it, only the PG trap and, and the other adult traps have been available for only a few years. Before that, it was immature uh, surveys, it was OV traps, it was uh, human bait. So the tools that we have now, when we combine them with uh, strategies to prevent, to go ahead and stratify the environment, act early in the year, if we, if we integrate the new technologies, data acquisition, real data gathering, I think that we are gonna to start to see uh, changes in, in, in how we can control ASGD, but we need to have a target. You know, you were talking about uh, eradication. So the, the policy changed from uh, elimination to control, but the, the big question has always been, okay, what is the degree of control that we need to achieve? You know, reducing mosquitoes, as you said, is not enough. We need to know when uh, that reduction is actually significant. Over. Well, thank you for those comments. That is a very important question. Um, on that note, I actually had a question for Chris Frederville, if he's still on the line. Um, uh, in my own lab, we've faced some setbacks, not on our end, but in working with some of our collaborators who have faced COVID setbacks. Um, has that been your case with um, Microsoft and the um, Premonition Project? I know everyone's very excited to see you doing that work. Is it moving forward as planned? Yeah, currently it's uh, it's actually moving forward really well. They, um, they were able to actually return to work a few, maybe a month or two ago to actually return back to the lab and start um, chomping away at it. And I think just the sheer numbers of, of people they have working on the project has helped push it along with, with minimal delays. Uh, the majority of the delays right now are kind of uh, some small engineering um, feats. So right now uh, they're proving the, the trap designs because the, they modified the trap slightly. And so they're proving the trap designs and the sensor designs to make sure that they actually hold up in the field. And so that's the the engineering part is the is the holdback, but I think we're making good progress. Great, glad to hear that. Yeah, we hope we hope to have our first allotment of traps in the first quarter of next year, um, and we'll probably we're going to try to get to a hundred traps across the the county. Um, uh, again, that's hoping that's if everything goes as planned, and then with eventual plans to scale up to a thousand traps. Wow, excellent. Looks like we have another question from Dr. Weaver. So this question goes a little bit back to yesterday, but since we have uh, a lot of our public health people uh, here speaking this morning, I wanted to throw this out for discussion today. We heard yesterday um, the results of the survey work done by uh, Texas A&M University of Colorado team looking at 
how much people are willing to pay for vector control. And in every location they did this survey, people were willing to pay more than is actually being spent by their local governments for vector control. Uh, that, that happened regardless of whether they live in a place where there's a very uh, minimal budget or a place like Harris County where there's a large budget. And I'm just uh, wondering if any of the public health people would comment on um, why this disconnect exists. Why do politicians not, are, are not willing to spend more on vector control? Do they not realize that the people support it? Do they just have financial constraints that make it impossible to do? What are your thoughts on why we have this disconnect, which is really a fundamental problem in improving vector control. We can design the best surveillance and control methods uh, in the world, but if we don't have the resources to implement them, then, then they won't improve the situation. So I was wondering if anyone would like to comment on this. I would. <laughs> um Thank you for that question, Dr. Weaver. This is Nina from Tarrant County. Um, and I was part of that study and I was very excited to be a part of that study. And let me tell you a little story. Uh, it has to go along with the importance of folks that are working in vector control and their knowledge of entomological, um, what, what affects entomology. I really think that uh, it's pretty clear when you look at the folks who are involved, they come from a wide expansion of a lot of different backgrounds. And a lot of these folks are wearing 25 different hats. And that's not a good thing. They think that a registered sanitarian can do restaurant inspections, can do pool inspections, can do mosquito work, and among other things. So really, there needs to be a focus on the importance of having someone who only does vector control and concentrating on those things. Unfortunately, that does take extra funding, and politicians do not support the funding. Um, here's another thing. When, when I wanted to do this survey before this research had come out, so when this had come up, and uh, uh, Dr. Hamer, I thank you for involving me with this. I was very excited because I've actually proposed doing the exact same thing, that survey, two years before it happened, after we uh, needed spraying in 2016. And I was told by our county administrator, and I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this, um, that it just wouldn't it just wouldn't happen. I said I said something about a vector controlled district because realistically that's what we need here in Tarrant and Dallas counties. And I was told that might be some little fantasy of yours, but it's never going to happen. And the answer is because of taxes and because Texas, um, you know, talks about how they don't want taxes and that's strictly what's being looked at. And so it's it's a combination of a lot of folks you know, not really concentrating on vector control in particular or being trained by people who actually know what they're doing, um, which, you know, we have all the help that we can get with with everyone involved here, especially Sonia Swiger. Thank you for all your work with that. Um, but it, it really is putting importance on on the knowledge that we all have and having a dedicated position. I'm telling that's that's one thing I can I hope shed some light on that. Thank you, that was very insightful. Yeah, this is Chris from Harris County. I, I, along those same lines, I don't think it's just a, a vector control issue. I think it's a larger public health issue. And just the way that our society kind of views health in general, we're a very transactional, like circumstance-based group. We don't, we're not really, we like to say uh, an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure, but we don't wanna pay for that ounce of prevention. We'd, ra we'd rather dump a whole bunch of money in on the cure than the, than the prevention. And so I think it's just a trickle down effect because a lot of uh, vector control agent or groups and are parts of health departments. Um, and I, I just think that it's very hard to get that, that preliminary funding pushed through it and get that through people's minds because everyone thinks, well, if you get sick, you go to the doctor. And I think that the whole COVID-19 um, uh, situation we're in now is, is just, it's, it's shining a light on, on a lot of these issues. Public health is one of those areas where it's very easy whenever you don't have a, a pandemic or an epidemic going on to say, well, we need more money over here right now. We'll, we'll give it back, we promise. And so they take a little piece, they take a little piece, they take a little piece, and then something happens and they go, oh no, we've been taking away and underinvesting all this time. So now we have to dump all of this money on it really right now to try to fix the problem. And so it becomes this feast or famine cycle that just keeps perpetuating itself. Thanks, Chris. I, I agree completely. Um, what I'm thinking is um, 
is this a unique time due to the COVID pandemic to try to make the case better for proactive investments? And is there anything that we as a center can do to help make the case in our region? I think now is a great time. Um, uh, I think that there there is probably something we can do, but I can't think of it in this split second. <laughs> well, I, I I do have to say, check out what the AMCA is is uh, working on with the Tick and Smash Act. And really, when it comes to the Tick and Smash Act, when that comes down from the government to the state and eventually to the local authorities, there's all these red tape that you have to deal with number one number two there's also something to be said about okay i can buy all the equipment in the world but if i don't have funding for people there's nothing that i can do with that i can have 2500 traps but if i only have one person that's not really going to help and so i think there needs to be a focus on personnel i mean i i I only have four personnel under myself, so there's only five people here at Tarrant County uh, trying to do a lot. And we have, you know, a lot of people within the municipalities, but all those poor people are wearing 15 different hats. And so they're struggling just to look for time to, yep. to even set a trap. And this is Stephen. I think a couple of things that um, we're seeing down here is Back in 2017, we were working with uh, Senator Lucio Cameron County and them for Senate Bill 1695. It got at least like halfway up for the mosquito control districts um, for those affected by Zika. I think a lot of it did come back to that funding issue is, um, I think data like this is very important and needs to continue to move forward because it helps show the public is willing to. And I think especially down here where there's lower poverty, a lot of people may have the presumption that oh, nope, it's gonna get rejected. The communities aren't gonna like it. Um, it's gonna get voted out. And I think if we start seeing well, the data is reflecting and continuous data reflecting that it is supported, but also cost analysis, kind of like what Nina was saying is that if we look at some of the impacts of not just equipment, but if we start looking at this through cost analysis measures of preventative costs for the future, kind of like what we're seeing <laughs> with COVID in prevention versus response, um, the funding dollars might be able to show that it is an investment, but it's going to pay off in the future. Yeah, and, and another thing is, um, I, I think looking at it and framing it more in an, through a, like an equity-based lens will help a lot as well. Um, I know that um, up in New Jersey, they had a pretty good, they, right now, vector control in general is, is very, uh, it's based on equality instead of equity. Um, and so everyone gets the same no matter what, right? If you have disease, you get this. It doesn't matter if you're a million dollar house or if you're living a two dollar house. Um, but I think that they did some cool things in New Jersey with the, um, I believe it was either into care or AGOs where they actually uh, sold the traps to uh, areas of, of uh, that had more means and they actually used those funds to subsidize areas that did not have the means so that you're actually amplifying your capabilities and, and covering more people. Um, but I, I think that it's just gonna take some creative approaches uh, to try to frame it uh, so that we can take care of everyone instead of just those with, with the funds to do it. Or you could put on a class for county commissioners. I, I you know, this is Nina again from Tarrant County and, and there is a very, very few opportunities where I actually get an opportunity to, to speak with county commissioners. And sometimes there's this, there's this, um, you know, don't listen to your internal people, but listen to external people kind of feeling that comes through. And I just think that it would be really great if y'all could maybe put some kind of classes on that could encourage local county commissioners and judges to actually be educated um, for vector control needs. Um, that I think might, might be helpful. Can I can I uh, comment on that, please? Yes. Doug. Yes, I I fully agree with you that uh, certainly more education is needed, more uh, informant or uh, <clears throat> government officials. But what we really need to do is come forth with a method that works. I, I will give you an example here in El Paso. I wouldn't I wouldn't if I was the mayor. I wouldn't give two cents for vector control simply because a lot of money goes out and I have just as many mosquitoes biting me in the backyard uh, last year and this year and, and there's no change. There's no uh, 
no impact whatsoever. So I think this center has an opportunity to, to really focus uh, some efforts on vector control. And, and I was thinking that maybe one of the approaches that one could use would be to do a model of kind of a community where you really uh, put an effort in it, focus and, 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 and uh, do your best uh, to make it work. Otherwise, uh, you know, we're going to continue like we have in the last hundred years uh, doing vector control, but uh, never seeing any really value coming out of the programs. Well, I have a good comment on that as, as well, because I'm sorry, I'm getting kind of excited. This is a great discussion, so thank you for having it. Um, w along with that is we only get funding for disease response and not particularly biting mosquitoes. It's almost as if in a public health view, they're not even looked at as being an issue. And I've been trying to describe this to American Mosquito Control Association. Um, and so, you know, there is more support. And I think Dr. Qualls and Heather Ward had written a great paper in the last AMCA, um, I think it was like a special episode that came out, uh, they actually had an article about how there's a lack of funding and a lack of support for vector control because no one actually does abundance or floodwater plane or those aggressive biters that come out. And so folks don't see um, a difference in the biting activity. It's because we're treating Culex. Culex aren't necessarily a problem. Uh, they go off and they bite birds most of the time and they can incidentally bite people, but probably more in your house. You know, this is this is not going to be observed. People are being bitten by Aedes aegypti and albopictus. And if we're in Tarrant County and we don't have a local uh, or a, a some kind of travel related Zika case, then we're, we're not even allowed really to treat for them. And so you know, the disconnect between the Texas home rule where we we don't have any jurisdiction to go into the cities and do anything and they don't want to do anything because they don't have funding. And then we're not treating for mosquitoes that are biting, but we're treating for mosquitoes that have disease that don't really bite. I mean, it's just it's a huge disconnect with all that. Thank you for the discussion, everyone. Um, I think we do need to get moving on to our final speaker of the day. Um, so I'll send it back to Carol.